Hi, thanks for joining us on MMT Mondays on Real Progressives. I'm Jeff Ginter, your host. So uh, we are presenting part two of Macroeconomics, the panel by the GIMS, the Gower Initiative for Modern Money Studies. Uh, so we're starting off with Martin Watson. He actually takes us through a bit of a uh, history of the progression of MMT. You know, uh, first trying to make headway with the uh, uh, orthodox economics. <laughs> that didn't work. Uh, but it's basically taking us through step by step, you know, how that has progressed. And then they do Q&A, uh, all three of them at the end. It's really fast. I love the Q&A at the end, and I think you will too. So I'll be back at the end. Bye-bye. Thank you, Bill. Uh, and now for our final speaker, last but certainly not least, the same warm welcome to uh, Martin, Professor Martin Watts, who, as mentioned earlier, was the joint author of the recently published macroeconomics <coughs> textbook. Martin is Emeritus Professor of Economics at Newcastle University, New South Wales, and Research Associate of the Centre of Full Employment and Equity. He has published over 60 peer-reviewed articles in a broad range of leading international and domestic and academic journals and co-authored 16 book chapters. Martin has gained extensive teaching experience over his career, primarily <coughs> in labour economics and macroeconomics. Welcome, Martin. Right, well, thank you very much. Um, some of what I um, am about to say, Bill has covered it to some degree, so I'm actually aware, um, aware of the time, so I'm not going to um, talk too long, I hope. Okay, so I was given some fairly rough and ready guidelines as to what I should talk about, um, and I came up with this uh, um, title for the talk uh, a few days ago, and as I say, there's a bit of duplication with Bill. So, first of all, by way of background, um, as Bill has said, mainstream neoclassical thinking is still dominant, um, but the development of MMT concepts um, started in the 90s with Randy, Bill and Warren, and the role of the uh, post-Keynesian thought uh, email discussion list, and I guess you can point to two fairly significant, uh, significant events in 1998. One was Randy's book, Understanding Modern Money, and also the uh, beginning of coffee. And Warren uh, was highly, very supportive of that development at the University of Newcastle. And really, in the years that have followed, you've really got two centres of MMT. The first being uh, UMKC, where Randy was, but uh, has retired, but he's still involved, um, and a series of academics, some of who are on the advisory board, and they have got a critical mass, and they've produced graduate students who've gone on uh, to teach MMT in a range of uh, American universities. And then, on a somewhat smaller scale, at the University of Newcastle, Bill, of course, uh, James Juniper, a colleague, and myself have um, been teaching MMT principles and using those principles in our research and graduate supervision. Um, engagement with ortho uh, orthodox economists at conferences and seminars in Australia became largely unproductive. Um, MMT ideas were treated with some indifference, um, if not contempt. I guess most of the time people were fairly polite. Um, dialogue ceased in the early 2000s. Um, it, I think it was 2002, Bill, when you asked the research director of, of the Reserve Bank uh, as to whether a Reserve Bank check had ever bounced. And there was a pregnant pause, and somebody mentioned that... <laughs> that would be a better way of putting it. Um, and then somebody talk, started talking about inflation. In other words, the inference that um, the government was going to spend lots and uh, cause inflation. There was also an, also an uneasy relationship with post-Keynesian economists um, who, despite a lot of uh, shared views, particularly about 
at least some aspects of the monetary system, uh, had concerns about the exchange rate if you introduced a full employment policy and equally uh, the inflation ramifications. And they have a particular hostility to the job guarantee, which seems to persist. So despite their rhetoric, uh, it's not clear that they really believe that full employment is sustainable. Um, and I guess pre-GFC, uh, there was some concern that an ageing and diminishing group of um, m and aficionados would spend their time talking to each other and the, um, the MMT message would really not get out. And of course what uh, did change uh, the uh, dialogue somewhat was of course the GFC and uh, the realisation that deregulated markets, particularly financial markets, uh, didn't work for the betterment of all. And also post-GFC of course the total reliance on monetary policy, albeit there was some token fiscal stimulus measures um, about 10 years ago, um, that's created a lot of uh, debate and post-Keynesians have been part of that debate in terms of saying that austerity is not the way to go. Uh, in terms of the mainstream, of course, um, they have made few concessions. Uh, their new monetary consensus does acknowledge that there is a role for fiscal policy under very specific circumstances. Um, what is uh, quite interesting is um, that mainstream introductory and intermediate texts uh, have tried to maintain a monetarist foundation that central banks are about controlling the money supply. Um, but at the same time, they want to incorporate the insights about the modern monetary system and how the central bank actually doesn't target the money stock, it actually sets the interest rate. And myself and some colleagues did a very detailed uh, review of four leading macro textbooks, and one has to conclude that they are totally incoherent. And quite how first-year teachers uh, can actually make sense of these textbooks is uh, hard to know. Um, of course, mainstream economists started talking about MMT. Uh, Krugman famously in the New York Times op-ed piece in 2011, subsequent articles uh, through to this year. Uh, MMT ideas represented by Bill's blog. Um, he mentioned that he's started a blog. Um, Randy didn't actually know what a blog was, I don't think. Uh, no. <laughs> what the F is a blog? <laughs> um, and they, uh, that blog and to a lesser extent New Economic Perspectives has, has been very influential and no doubt many of you present have read Bill's blog. Um, Bill made brief reference to the sort of sequence of um, what happens when new ideas are introduced, uh, largely ignored, and that was the case prior to the GFC, acknowledged but ridiculed, and here we have a couple of uh, academics, uh, well, Pally in the US, Ren Lewis in this country, um, who essentially say what's old is correct and what's new is wrong. In other words, MMT doesn't really add anything. Um, and, of course, the somewhat hysterical um, discussion that's now going on, particularly in America. But uh, recently, we've, there has been some quite sympathetic material, articles in uh, uh, seri relatively serious newspapers, even the Australian, uh, strangely enough, which is a Murdoch publication, um, and, of course, the defining moment really was um, AOC uh, starting to talk about MMT, which led to the condemnation which Bill made reference to at the beginning of his talk. And, of course, the uh, Senate motion, which uh, essentially was supported by uh, Lawrence Summers, surprise, surprise, Janet Yellen, and a whole series of uh, members of 
right-wing think tanks. Uh, but equally support for MMT from a range of indiv individuals, including this uh, financial character. Do you know him, Warren? Montier? Which was Yeah. Uh, which is, he, his blog is very good. He's very supportive of uh, MMT, and he captures MMT in a very few words. And it's a fairly catchy title, too. Um, OK, so that's by way of background. So I'm going to briefly talk about the dominance of mainstream economics. I mean, Bill also has already made some reference to that, raising the profile of MMT, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so in an ideal world, in a university system that works in a discipline that is not dysfunctional like economics, you would think that the frank and fearless exchange of ideas would lead to some sort of progress in the, in the paradigm. But there are serious uh, vested interests at work in terms of tenure, promotion, um, general progression in, in the academic scene and uh, the prospect of other lucrative opportunities resulting from some uh, profile. Um, I also reflect on um, the issue of paradigm change, contradictions emerging in, in the paradigm, and how that leads, potentially, at least according to Kuhn, to a crisis in the prevailing paradigm and the resolution of anomaly via a new paradigm. Um, one may pose the question, uh, well, if you believe Kuhn, you would think that economic thought is actually progressing. And so us mere mortals here are standing on the shoulders of giants of the past and everything is moving forward. Well, unfortunately, it ain't as simple as that. Um, and certainly, when you look at uh, the responses to the GFC, um, policymakers had learned nothing um, from uh, the lessons of the Great Depression. Um, one can talk about debates about the philosophy of science. Milton Friedman just thought that theories should be uh, tested on the basis of their predictions. He didn't realise that different theories could lead to the same predictions, which is observational equivalence. Um, and more fundamentally, there has been this separation, this divorce, if you like, in terms of academic debate. The mainstream stay over here and we stay over here because it's quite pointless in trying to engage with them. So, Raising the public profile of MMT, well, obviously, it's starting to happen. It seems to me it's quite interesting to think about the dynamics of um, the introduction of new ideas into the political domain. Do interest groups and public opinion drive the agenda and the politicians follow, or is it the reverse? And... An example to me, and I, I could be accused of being wrong here, is that we had the same-sex uh, marriage debate in Australia where clearly activism, <coughs> grassroots activism prevailed. And obviously politicians then get on board, but the activists drive, drive the agenda. <coughs> and it seems to me in terms of MMT, the role of politicians is that much more important because... The ideas are intangible and counterintuitive, and unless you have politicians talking about them, then to really get some traction is very difficult. And the problem, of course, with most politicians is that they're careerist and they lack vision, and they're really unwilling to bite the bullet and articulate counterintuitive ideas. So the government is not financially constrained when they believe there's a very high cost of doing that. And this sort of political cowardice you've, we've certainly observed in Australia, and you've had dealings with the Greens, haven't you, Bill, with 
no uh, positive impact in terms of their view about macro policy. Um, so AOC, Alexandria Ortiz Cortez, has played a very important role in the US. Uh, political recognition of MMT, at least in the US, is a start. Um, and one would assume that other politicians would now start engaging with the debates. Um, and clearly there is a role for activism, not only engaging with politicians, but getting, if you like, the critical mass of the population to start embracing MMT ideas. And I won't presume to provide advice as to how that should be done as such. What is important is the nature of the MMT message which is disseminated. And we came across this sort of issue uh, at the last uh, MMT conference uh, in New York. Um, as I say, some of the mainstream media at least giving, are giving MMT a run. Um, at present, my perception is the UK debate, like in the US, is very superficial between academic economists. There's Pally in the US, who's frankly dreadful. Um, highly, very superficial. And what tends to happen is they don't really uh, address the body of MMT work. They select a few um, papers or books or whatever, and they don't reflect on the fact that people are writing about MMT even in 19, uh, 2019. Um, the UK criticism seems to be, well, is obviously of our blogs to some degree, Portes, um, mainly Macro, which is Simon Ren Lewis's uh, blog, and there's been, as I understand it, significant Twitter activity, but I don't subscribe to Twitter because my life is too short. Uh, and also, if we're going to have a serious academic debate, a serious discussion, then Twitter is really totally inappropriate. And what I find interesting in, in respect of uh, Simon Ren Lewis is that he has not written a mainly macro blog about MMT this year. So it's uh, more subterranean in terms of using Twitter. Um, macro is difficult, there's no doubt. Uh, like most disciplines, it is uh, driven by concepts and principles. Um, the fallacy of composition is very challenging. Theoretical models are very important. But developing a theoretical model specifically in algebraic terms, does not give it credibility <coughs> per se, because it is the nature of the assumptions, something that Friedman wished to ignore. Um, so the really important thing in terms of the dissemination of MMT is to reflect on the fact that it is the, the current state of understanding is the result of many years of thought and interaction amongst MMT economists and that for anybody who is pushing out the message it's very important to understand the principles and not start uttering glib two-liners about government can provide for your every need. So, um, in very general terms, MMT incorporates chartalism and functional finance, but it's grounded in, in institutional practice. In other words, what central banks actually do, as well as what banks actually do, and how fiscal policy is constructed. So, Warren has touched on this. This is a rather more sort of formal way of talking about the fiat currency. Um, it's issued by the state, it's a unit of account, it's got value because the state imposes taxes in that currency. Um, and fiat money is money that the state has declared to be legal tender. Now that doesn't require legal tender laws because if people are paying their taxes in the currency, then other transactions between um, households and firms and so, so on will, will also take place using that currency. 
Then we have functional finance, which goes back to learner and the notion that fiscal policy should be used to counteract economic fluctuations to secure full employment and price stability. And you can completely ignore the impact on deficits and accumulated debt. Institutional practice, as I say, refers to how these key institutions work, how they operate. And given that institutional practice is precisely what central banks and others say they do, it is really not theory at all. And you can read, you can go to the Bank of England website, you can go to the RBA website in Australia, and they'll tell you what they actually do, how they make sure that the rate they uh, announce every month is the rate that banks lend to each other how they engage in open market operations and so on. Uh, the idea of institutional practice, though, is somewhat nuanced because there is a distinction between uh, what MNT says about the uh, capacity of the monetary system to operate and, indeed, policy and the fact that, it, that countries impose involu uh, sorry, voluntary constraints on the operation of certain um, aspects of policy. So, for example, major purchases of government debt on the primary market, in other words, when that debt is issued, uh, the Bank of England doesn't go and buy a whole, la whole load of that debt. Um, that is either outlawed or simply in practice doesn't occur in many countries. Not all countries, because Canada is a bit different. So it's very important to distinguish between talking in very, fairly abstract terms about MMT and the capacity of <coughs> these institutions and how to operate in a particular way and the way that institu in these institutions in a particular country operate. And all, uh, countries are different. And in writing the textbook, that has been a challenge, that uh, institutional arrangements do differ across countries. Um, so it's very important that MMTers are very clear about what they're talking about. Not, are they talking in, abs in abstract terms or are they talking about the operation of the US economy um, or the UK economy or whatever? Um, and, well, let me move on to the next. <coughs> no, I'll go back. Um, so if we're talking in fairly abstract terms, then it's important to realise that uh, there, that currency sovereignty is highly important in terms of the capacity of, uh, well, the way, for the way the conduct of policy can be conducted. Now, currency sovereignty is very important because it refers to a, an economy with its own currency, so not a Eurozone country, operating with a freely floating exchange rate, and also, and this really doesn't apply to modern developed economies, not overexposed to, current, to debt denominated in a foreign currency. There's no reason for a country with its own, well, a modern developed economy with its own currency, there's no reason for it to acquire, or sorry, to sell foreign currency denominated debt. And if you have a a country which satisfies those conditions, including the one about debt exposure, and Australia fits the bill very well, and the UK would as well, then, of course, monetary and fiscal policies can be focused purely on the domestic economy. So the external economy, and therefore trade and exchange rates, will be, will be handled by the fact there is a flexible exchange rate. So... In terms of engagement of MMT ideas with those who don't agree, these basic principles are of central importance. They really are the key 
building blocks. Um, and in terms of when I read articles that are often critical of MMT, and I'm wary of the time, so I'll be quick. Um, if the article doesn't talk about these principles, then, as far as I'm concerned, it's totally deficient. If you're talking about the operation of the macroeconomy in a particular country, you've got to understand what the institutional arrangements are. OK, and a warning about, as I say, glib statements. You know, government can spend and buy anything that it wants, um, and to just set up your wish list, you know, get rid of student loans, uh, more money in the national health, blah, blah, blah. There is a, a real resource limit on, obviously, what can be spent. OK, the textbook. Well, uh, I'll be very brief about this. Um, of course, the textbook joined a very uh, illustrious stable of textbooks, including Mankey and Krugman, um, guilt by association, I suppose, but hope, hopefully not. Uh, it does represent the consolidation of the work that's been done over 20 years. Uh, it is pretty rigorous in terms of how it's developed. Um, and let me just... Uh, I'm going to jump a few because I'm wary of the time. Um, I'll just go to the con content. The conceptual basis and theoretical basis of MMT is, is very carefully outlined. The, there's rigorous stock flow consistent modelling and uh, is adopted and illustrated by the use of balance sheets. Um, there is a breadth and depth of analysis of competing perspectives. So it's not as if Although it's an MMT book, we ignore the uh, alternative views, but we don't pretend to be pluralist <coughs> because we understand how modern monetary systems work. Lots of reference to empirical evidence, including three major currency crises. History of thought gets a lot of attention and contemporary policy issues in the last few chapters, which are uh, obviously highly relevant. Uh, Teaching MMT, um, I won't go through all this, other than to say that uh, you need good students and committed students. And there weren't that many when I was teaching it at Newcastle. Um, the good ones that one comes across, they become very excited with the ideas. And some of them obviously go on to postgraduate work, which is very rewarding. Um, but the majority probably want to do marketing or some other ma you know, major in their uh, degree, and uh, economics is simply too hard for them. OK, final comments. Uh, we are making some progress in terms of getting traction. Uh, it is important that the ideas are represented appropriately um, in, in public discussion and uh, discussion with friends in the pub and so on. Um, I hope that the textbook is useful in assisting the uh, transmission of the MMT framework to both students and interested public. Um, you have to deal with initial disbelief. I don't know what percentage of you is still in the state of initial disbelief. It may be very few. Um, so, well, you can assist in this process of... Uh, the emergence and consolidation of MMT in the public sphere by reading the book and also recommending the book. And this is not supposed to be a sales plug for the book. It's supposed to be getting the ideas of MMT out. So thank you very much. Hello. Oh, hi. <clears throat> hi. Uh, my name is John Meyer. I'd like to address this to uh, either Bill or Warren. Uh, in World War II, the US government funded the war effort, um, pr presumably from a currency creation perspective, from an MMT perspective, and then raised war bonds under the guise of funding the war. Um, 
But I have read, and I don't know if this is the case, and I'd like to know what your thoughts are as to whether that was an anti-inflationary measure to issue war bonds when, they, when it isn't a requirement. Do you want to answer the question straight away? Do you want a bit of time to think and we get the next question? Yeah, yeah. The, the war bonds were issued really as a, uh, a solidarity measure. There were all these posters, you know, about un uh, Uncle Sam and stuff. And they wanted uh, uh, people to feel as though they were part of the war effort. That's what the historians tell us. The main price, price uh, uh, initiatives were rationing. That's how they. That that was the rations were the fear of inflation rather than the war bonds. Just sorry. Oh, sorry. Just just a quick interesting story to that. Uh, one of our associates is Jamie Galbraith, and his father was John Kenneth Galbraith, and he, he was in charge of that. And so I talked to him about it a little bit. I'm, I'm not a student of it, and um, pretty much like, you know, as Bill said, but because uh, it, it was interesting, because I come along and I said, look, you know, the, pri the, the price level is a function of prices paid by government, they're the monopoly supplier. And he talked about, yeah, you know, his dad had said about that during World War II, you know, and they recognize, they recognized prices paid by government was critical, you know, in, in this thing. But when they came to the 70s, all the Keynesians at the time went in and with price and wage controls in the economy. And that, I think that's what discredited the Keynesian movement from uh, everything else, you know, because no matter how bad things got, people didn't want the government telling them how much they could charge at a grocery store or something like that. And the irony is that these, you know, I said, didn't, didn't they know that it was government prices being set and not private sector, they didn't need to do that. He said, and he said, you know, this was before his father died, he said, yeah, a few years ago we went back and we were going to write something about that, but I guess they never got around to it. But it's, it's kind of an interesting irony that they certainly should have known that, and it certainly should have given them different proposals for the 70s, but it, did, it didn't get carried over. Yeah. I feel I have to add to that. Yeah. Um, I mean, not to do with the US experience, but of course war bonds were issued uh, at the beginning of World War II in this country. And it was very much seen in terms of solidarity and all that. And the war bonds were highly undersubscribed. And uh, the sort of propaganda issues of the German, Germans crowing that the Brits couldn't even raise some money from their own population was such that they actually the central, well, the Bank of England fudged it and said that indeed, yes, the allocation had been sold uh, and it, it hadn't been. And Keynes got to know about this and said, masterful. <laughs> at, at the beginning of the Iraq war, the US had a proposal out to have war bonds. And I think somebody from the Treasury told the politicians, like, we, we got it covered. We don't need to, we don't need to do that. <laughs> OK. Thanks. OK. Right. Um, I, I, any of you can answer this if you, if you want, or you can do what you did then. Uh, I'm Ian, Ian Charles, uh, um, and I ask this question to ordinary people because from time to time our Royal Mint issues another set of coins, and at the moment we have a pound coin, a uh, lovely little thing with 12 sides, uh, and it reminds me of something that we had when there were 240 pennies to the pound, there were great big things with pennies, four centimetres across, but we had a threepenny bit or a three pence coin, and there were 80 of them to the pound. Now, the spending power to a little boy was that threepenny bit would get me from my house in Leeds to the centre of Leeds. It would also, if I chose, uh, if I had another one, I would spend it on a comic book, something like Beano or Dandy or something like that, that I could read on the bus or at any other time. And the other thing that it would do, small boys economics, was that it would buy me an ice lolly, a fruity ice lolly, with, sort of okay, uh, and a, and with an ice cream middle. Now, the, the spending power of the new pound coin doesn't do that. 
You would need two pounds now in order to purchase what a threatening bit, 80 to the pound, would be. And people, I've asked people this and they've said, it's inflation. Well, I know, I know it's inflation. But I want to know, and grind down the currency, or whatever. I want to know who would do such a thing, or where the other 159 threatening bits have gone, and perhaps why couldn't we just spend as much, much as we need on the NHS or uh, write off the student debt? Why couldn't we do that? What would happen if we did? So it's a, all tied up with why inflation, who would cut a currency into lots of little bits, uh, where it's gone, who's got it, and why can't we do a bit of it? Okay, <laughs> okay thanks. If you had been an adult then, instead of buying your lollies. If what? If you had been an adult at that point, instead of buying your lollies, your income would have been significantly lower than it is now. So you, you, you're only focusing on one aspect of the relative price rather than the, all the other. You, you, your capacity is much greater now. So sure, you can call that inflation if you want, but it's a pretty meaningless way of thinking about it. So what, what matters isn't what one pound buys, it's what all the pounds buy. So what did all the pounds buy last year? What was your real GDP that was somehow distributed, I assume fairly equally in the UK, right? <laughs> 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 Not like the US. So. Okay, so, but how, how is that whole, how is your pile of stuff? Is your pile of real stuff large or small? How, what, what did all the pounds buy, no matter what the number is? And that's gone up by one, two, three percent a year, depending on your productivity and growth rate and everything else. And that, that's the important thing for your real standard of living. And of course, the distributional issues are serious, but it's a different issue. Moving rapidly on. Yeah, my name is Christopher Brewster. My question is I'd like, assuming that modern monetary theory is an accurate analysis of the current economic system uh, and the way capitalism works, um, I'd like a few thoughts from the, the, the panel about uh, things like the Green New Deal, particularly in view of the fact that growth of any sort has, seems to have deleterious effects on the environment. Uh, and uh, a lot of recent research, I refer you to Jason Hickel's recent uh, paper, shows that it's very, very difficult to decouple economic growth from impacts on the environment. So I'd like to, just to expand on those thoughts. Uh, how can we, uh, how can monetary theory work towards perhaps an alternative economic system uh, that goes beyond the current system as we have it in view of our, our economic impact? I mean, one of the, um, I've had a long history of, uh, Let's be kind. Dis discuss discussions with the Greens. And um, <laughs> I'm being polite, but I'm trying. But I'm trying to work out how to be polite. Yeah. And the 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 point is that uh, that these discussions are typically between. Uh, cosmopolitans and and others, where the things that they're they're talking about are affecting rural communities, say in terms of forestry. So they say from Sydney, they say we've got to ban all forestry, yet they never consider in Warhope, which is a rural area in New South Wales, which relies on forestry for jobs and their material standard of living. What's going to be the effect on them? And so one of the tensions, I think, in all of this Green New Deal stuff is that tension that, that how do you ensure that you don't kill off the material prosperity of communities that are relying on pollutive activity? That's the first point. Second point is, I say, you know, we've got to have zero growth. And then I say, well, are you going to give up your mobile phone? Are you going to stop driving your car? And of course, the, the problem is if you have... And moreover, are you going to start 
start uh, compulsory um, sterilisation of people. And the point is that if you have population growth, you have to have economic growth to maintain material standards of living. Now then you have a big distributional argument because I'm happy to give up material, my material, some of my material, not my phone. <laughs> <laughs> but but that's not going to be enough. And so the Green New Deal, the way I con conceive of it, is that first of all it's got to have a, a recognition of all of us that there's got to be just transitions. That means that we have to make sure that those people in the communities that are going to lose I don't lose too much in material terms. We can't really address the sort of spiritual... When I was doing my PhD in Manchester, it was at the height of the mining strike. Shows how old I am. <laughs> and, you know, those mining communities, they, they, it was more than an income to them, it was their identity. So we can't really fix that up. So that's the first point. The second point is that we have to understand that the market will not deliver satisfactory outcomes. And that leads to the next point is that we've got to ensure that it doesn't, the Green New Deal doesn't become financialised. And what I mean by that is vehicles for whole new sets of products and derivative products <laughs> that basically the Wall Street and their, their city here benefit from. And what that then leads you to think is that and this is a real disagreement I have with the Greens, is that they're advocating carbon trading systems. That's a market system. That's a financialisation of, of the, the environmental problem. And I get, I get uh, death threats at home in the, in the mail because I advocate closing... I live in a coal district. Newcastle is the largest coal export port in the world. And I advocate no market system, just the government announced in 20 years' time, no more coal exports. Because if you, once you embrace trading systems, you financialise the problem and you'll get these, these obscene situations where, where the big polluters go into small communities in less developed countries like northern India and that ruin the community so that they can claim carbon credits that they can then continue polluting in their other country. So they're the, they're the things that I think about. And the other thing is that the Green New Deal, total support for it, but it's a major transformation of society and there's huge vested interests that are at stake and you've just got to be patient. It's going to take time. I had two, two things I wanted to reinforce, see if I could remember both of them. So, first of all, it comes back to Unemployment. I think the major cause of environmental, environmental degradation is unemployment, people looking for money. Okay, so if you had full employment, people had good jobs, they wouldn't want the trees cut down, they wouldn't want anything dumped in the rivers, but when it comes to needing the money, they have a different opinion. So number one, so many things start with real solid full employment policy where there's jobs, opportunity, and everything else. So I think that's part of the problem, and I don't think the Greens have gone and recognized that it's fundamental. Uh, the other thing is <clears throat> rationing by price, such as the carbon schemes, are regressive. Any t when you're rationing by price, it's regressive. And some things you want to do that. There should be rewards for having excelled and done better or fine, but not something like that. Okay, that doesn't fit at all. So too many of these market, um, in fact, all of them, but I'll say too many, <laughs> uh, they just, it's all regressive ways to do it, where the people who can least afford it are the ones that pay the most in real terms. And so I just wanted to add those two things that amplify what Bill was saying. Okay, more questions. Hi, um, I'm Martin Frieden here. Um, a question on inflation, but just prior to that, I just want to comment on two things that uh, Warren and Bill just said. Bill, you mentioned something about the Green New Deal and the problem with population. And Warren, you mentioned, well, if you get full employment. Actually, there's an amazing video on TED by Hans, the late Hans Rosling showing very elegantly, there may be other arguments, how to deal with a population explosion problem, which is making the poorest more wealthy quicker than their 
birth rate goes down dramatically. And there's a very elegant way, if you look at Hans Rosling on TED on that. Back to inflation, uh, yeah, I'm sort of vaguely socially active. One of the things I'm on is on Quora. Um, so me and this guy, John Besterfield, who I doubt is here, I think he lives in the States, we're active on that. So there's also usual questions about that. I've got your excellent uh, textbook. There's not enough there for me to answer some of the inflation questions, so I'm you know, reading your papers and so on. So on inflation in general, the, you know, there's a question about the Weimar Republic, which basically I gave an answer. Well, look what Keynes did with the economic consequences of peace. If we'd had MMT then, we'd have put it in a very similar analysis, showing the dangers of those policies leading to inflation and potentially hyperinflation. But it also makes me think about, for example, looking at Venezuela, which is large foreign currency there, and all sorts of other factors to do with the oligarchy in the US. Um, you know, I'm looking for like decent analysis because looking at it now, it should be obvious you could have made an argument, an MNT analysis of Venezuela a few years ago. Uh, but it's very easy to do these things with hindsight. Um, you know, we look around at all these uh, Austrians who keep on making these complaints about inflation and they can keep on being wrong, which is great. We show them why they're wrong and they're wrong. But on the other side, there are scenarios where inflation occurs. Is anyone doing the analysis to make policy recommendations? Don't do this because there'll be inflation. For example, with Venezuela, where there's foreign currency debt and the supply side crash when the oil price dropped. I mean, the Venezuela is the latest one. But for 20 years or so, Zimbabwe's been the, the poster child for hyperinflation. And if I ask this audience, what do you know about what happened in Zimbabwe? How many people have a detailed knowledge of what happened? Some people, not many. It had nothing to do with deficits, particularly fiscal deficits. What happened in Zimbabwe, and it's a similar story to the Weimar Republic, what happened in Zimbabwe was Robert Mugabe decided he wanted to reward his freedom fighters who, who uh, took them out of the colonial yoke of Britain. And the way he did it, so the sentiment, I think, as a left progressive, I think it was a great idea. But the way he did it was ridiculous because Zimbabwe had the, had the most efficient agricultural sector in Africa. It was the food bowl of Africa. And so what he did, he said, OK, I'll reward... And, and, he, and he was also addressing another issue. Uh, uh, um, the colonial land tenure <laughs> outcomes were incredibly unequal, white versus black. The whites had the land, the blacks didn't. So he wanted to redress that. And so he gave the farm... He, he, you, know, you, you know the story. He, they, they took the farms over. These were good machine gunners, hopeless farmers. And within a very short time, 60% of agricultural output collapsed. And that led to a whole lot of other things happening with using the, what foreign exchange they had to fund food imports rather than to provide uh, money for manufacturers to import capital and all this sort of stuff. But under those circumstances, any spending, whether it's private or public, would be inflationary. It told you nothing about the conduct of fiscal policy. And I'm not saying the conduct of fiscal policy was good. I'm just saying that you can't use the hyperinflation to give you any information about the conduct of fiscal policy. It doesn't tell you anything about what would happen if the British government funded a job guarantee scheme. Nothing at all. If you have a society where the supply side crashes, you're going to probably get hyperinflation. So, you know, we, we're, all the talk on inflation comes down to what happens if you have overspending, too much demand. And yes, you can cause inflation doing that. I'm sure Bill and I, if you put us in charge, said I want 100% inflation, we, we wouldn't be like the European Central Bank. We could get that done quick. But, <laughs> yeah, I could do it in Japan in 20 minutes. I get all the inflation I want on the fiscal side. You know, eliminate the consumption tax. Don't add to it. I can show you how to get some spending going. But, of course, the deficit would go up, right? So we, we know how to do this. They don't, right? They're going the other way. But 
The thing is, I've been around since 1973, 45 years. I have never seen inflation caused by excess demand. I've just never seen it. It's, I know it's there. So all the inflations are caused by something else. So let's go to Turkey today with 25% inflation. The unemployment headline is 10%. Their debt to GDP is only 35%. They've got 25% a year inflation. I don't know, it's not coming from excess demand. One place it's coming from is their overnight rates, their policy rates, 24%. And I've been making the case that the interest rate, for all practical purposes, will be the inflation rate. Uh, and, but, you know, we're just a quick answer here. So the other thing, now Venezuela, the other place that inflation comes from is Google Venezuela uh, corruption. <laughs> and you'll see Mr. So-and-so was arrested in Miami after having somehow borrowed $2.4 billion from the banking system, sold the currency, got U.S. dollars, and was money laundering in Miami. All right, that's just one guy, <laughs> $2.4 billion. When, when you're borrowing money through the banking system, I won't say illegally, but you know, like that, insiders getting loans that they're not going to pay. There is no such thing. They're not real assets. And then you sell the currency. Immediately, they don't care what the exchange rate is because they're going to get their dollars and abscond with it, right? And you do that over and over again, your currency collapses. And it doesn't matter if it's just dropped 50%. They'll do it again. If it's dropped 25%, they'll do it again. And what happens is, I was just reading about um, Venezuela today, they're still using bolivars. They might need a million of them, to your point, instead of one. But they're, they're still, well, I need it to buy food. I need it to do this. They're still there. And, and, and so you've got the banking system, which can be an open channel of corruption, and state-owned enterprises do the same thing. If you've got corruption in the state-owned enterprises where they're getting funded by the government, allowed to borrow uh, public credit, and then people, insiders are selling foreign exchange, the currency, the exchange rate goes down, you will see inflation coming in through the foreign exchange window. So I, I could go on and on on this. Just to finish, we discuss it later. Yeah. Was, why are we not making this analysis before these events occur? Rather than hindsight, it's very easy to make this analysis. That's what I'm looking for. Well, I think, you know, the analysis that corruption has been problems in Latin America in places like Turkey and state-owned enterprises all over the world, is they get politicized. The problem with, you know, private ownership has serious problems, there's no question about that. We see it all the time. But the politicization of public you know, it's just as well publicized. It's all dangerous stuff. It's got to be regulated, supervised, somehow monitored. This is, you know, it all goes back. And if I had been writing my blog when Robert Mugabe announced he was going to take yeah. all the farms over, you would have had a bit of a blog about it. Yes. <laughs> and then he would have done it that way. <laughs> that would have stopped it. <laughs> Gentlemen at the back. Hi, thanks. Yeah. The, uh, uh, my name's uh, Tony. I, I'm. I'm totally with virtually everything that's said today. The one sort of slight issue I have is the um, exports equals bad, imports equals good element of MMT. Because the way I see it, for, for most economies such as the UK, uh, we, we bring in imports, definitely very good. We, we, we give them our pounds in return. But obviously in the long run, that means that the people who hold the pounds have a call on UK assets or UK goods and services. So the way I see it, ultimately, it would net to zero. The one exception to that, where I do agree with you, is America, as with the exorbitant privilege of the dollar, then the, the people who get dollars are happy to use the dollars for buying oil, buying gold, buying copper. They don't have to spend it in America. So I totally agree, you, agree with you in terms of the dollar, but the, I, I, I don't agree with the export is, is bad, imports good for everything other than the dollar. Can you talk about that? Well, so, so what's happening is you're taking in real goods and services, and somebody else is piling up a sterling account at your bank, right? So, uh, uh, and it's not a governmental deficit. The government hasn't done anything. It's just somebody in the private sector is doing this. And whoever's holding those accounts is taking a pretty enormous risk because the value is undefined. We just saw what's happened to each one. Okay, and if at some point it suits public purpose to not allow your Exports, you can do that. You can put export controls on. You can have export taxes. You can do all kinds of things to make sure that guy who, you know, from Korea who sold you all those Hyundais can't buy anything with that money he got. 
And you know what? They don't care. Because the reason they're doing it is because the exporters are in charge in those countries. And they're doing it to keep <coughs> their wages low, to suppress their real costs, right? So that they can sell to you so that he can make his profit margin, whatever it is. And he doesn't really care about what's happening to the standard of living of his uh, country, population, or whether in 10 or 20 years they can ever buy anything with the dollars the government has piled up as foreign exchange res reserves to support his immediate sales. So you're, you're on the right side of the trade, let's put it that way. You've got all the, you hold all the cards at that point. They have a number in a bank account and you have control of all your product that you can export or not on any terms you want. You haven't guaranteed prices in the future. If you guarantee prices in the future, that falls under external debt. That's a whole different thing. Australia's been running uh, external deficits of about 4% of GDP since, uh, since the 70s. And uh, that, that means that the rest of the world are accumulating these financial assets in Australian dollars. And we're getting iPhones. <coughs> now, who's got, all the, who's got the real risk? I don't have the real risk. I've got the iPhone. And the car and the BMWs and all the rest of it. I don't have a BMW. <laughs> Motorcycle. And so imagine these people that are holding all these Australian dollars, and I'm using Australian dollars specifically to avoid this US stuff. Now, what are they going to do with it? Well, if they try to sell it, you know, th then the, a lot of progressives say, well, they'll just dump the Australian dollar. Well, They'd be stupid to do that because they'll make immediate losses. <laughs> so the first thing is that they're, they're going to be risk averse in liquidating the stocks of Australian dollars they hold. Okay, so then what can they do with them? Okay, they can transfer them into real goods and services for available for sale in Australian dollars. Well, that's why Australia's got a foreign investment review board to stop, stop them having unregulated capacity to buy whatever they can that's for sale. So we don't allow foreigners to buy real estate unless they, 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 they produce new, new real estate, houses. Now, the foreign invest, uh, investment guidelines, in my view, are far too lax because we've, we, we've, we're seeing in our cities uh, apartment block blooms, be, blooms because they can actually build new constructions. And there's one famous case in Melbourne where I grew up where they've done uh, studies of the water usage and they, these towers are 80% unoccupied. They're just speculative vehicles. So that's the first point. The risk, risk is on the exporter, not the importer. This, the, 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 but the second point, and, and I agree with you, this is an agreement, is that as a progressive left person, I don't want foreign capital being able to use that money, that is those Australian dollar holdings, in ways that give corporate sector leverage. And so, I, you know, I think and, and I, I think this is a problem everywhere, that you've got to make sure that that money can't be used to manipulate the political process through lobbying. You've got to have very tight restrictions, like Warren said, on what they can buy and what they can't buy with it in Australian dollars. But it's not just the, this idea that because the US is the, the so-called reserve currency, that MMT only applies to the US, is a, is a falsehood. It applies to any monetary system. Out there you have the likes of the JP Morgan World Index. And they give every currency a weighting. It adds up to 100%. And if you're a prudent investor, you want your diversity of currency holdings to be fit that. So if you're in India, you just sold your construction company for rupee or whatever, and you want to retire, you now go to your investment management person, he says, okay, well, you need to diversify across countries, and 4% is going to be in Australian dollars, and 22% will be US dollars, and so on. When they do that, they've assured these countries in the index that they will be net, they can be net importers forever if they want to, because those, those money, those funds go into retirement accounts, pension funds, they're all diversifying, 
uh, globally this way. All the people working check off the box, yes, I want global diversification because over the last 28 years it's been 0.5% better than not doing it or some study somebody did. And is it that those uh, funds never get spent. They just pile up forever. Yeah. It's equally worth noting that occasionally fears are expressed about the Chinese dumping U.S. denominated assets when it never happens for the you know, same reason of capital loss. Actually, right. actually they, they did do it for almost a trillion a few years ago. Nobody even noticed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, moving on. Where is the... Um, my name's Christopher Hughes, um, and I'm like the Christopher front who's actually gone now. My question was um, George Monbiot's article in The Guardian a couple of weeks ago uh, on capitalism. Uh, in the middle of the article, there was one five word paragraph which said, Green growth is an illusion. And that's, that was my question. And I don't want to provoke Bill into using Anglo Saxon in public. But um, I suppose my subsequent question would be, um, I spoke of, in an exchange with Patricia Pino last week. Um, she, she tweeted, um, then they ridicule you. And I asked, when do you think we will, we'll, we'll enter the phase of we will win? And I just wondered what, what the panel thought of that. Um, the, the, in most of the advanced countries, the the unmet need is going to be in terms of personal care services and environmental care services. And those types of occupations and jobs and services deliver massive social benefits, but they're hard to get profit from. And um, so if you transfer people out of coal mining into personal care services, GDP continue to grow, so we, we, we say there's still economic growth going on, but that's green growth because very low carbon intensive in reading a person a book and massaging their feet and doing their garden and growing more trees for them because then they can be maintained under a job guarantee. So I just don't buy this argument that you can't have green growth. We've got to have growth with, with more people. And until we come... And I take... I think Martin's point's very important, that uh, the, the more educated we become and the more secure we're in employment we become, we have less children. Because we don't have to have our own social security uh, scheme with you know, more children. But that's an evolutionary thing. But we can have green growth, and what that implies, I didn't mention it under Green New Deal, is that society is going to have to have an engaged debate where it reflects that the proportion of growth that's taken by the public sector will have to be larger in the future. Now, that's not socialism I'm advocating, although I do advocate socialism. <laughs> but that's a reality that it's shifting to activities that provide net social benefits rather than provide net private benefits. Question for Bill. How many, how many research assistants do you think the average university professor would hire if he had the budget for it? Oh, no <laughs> Infinite. <laughs> Labor shortage already. The lady on the... Hello there. Um, to talk about UBI, uh, I realised that you obviously didn't have a lot of time to go into a lot of detail, but I had a totally different idea about it. Uh, give an example, you might have a, um, a couple where uh, one partner is working so that the other one can perhaps either go to university or study or uh, develop a new business or some sort of business idea uh, so that um, it's okay with a, with a couple so one can earn the money, but if this person on their own, they can't do that. So that was my idea for UBI, and also <coughs> things like uh, you mentioned earlier, carers uh, who have to look after uh, you know disabled or sick people in their family, uh, so they'd have a, some sort of proper income. Uh, and the only other question I had was, uh, uh, have you ever spoken to John McDonald, or would you like to do so? <laughs> 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 
Uh, on the last, I had a meeting with him last October. Very unsatisfactory outcome. Uh, he, uh, I publicly acknowledge he, his Labor Party is being poisoned by their advisers. Uh, on the UBI, there's the last example, you just described a job, a Care, caring job, not, not, a, not, a, not a government paying for doing nothing. You're, provide, you're talking about a job. In the set first instance, you're talking about making opportunities available for people to be educated. That's a publicly funded education scheme, not UBI. Okay, so let's go back to Pompeii for a moment. They put a, <laughs> they put a tax on everybody's house, and then they said, you know what? We're going to give everybody UBI, so we'll give you enough money to pay the tax. So nobody has to worry about it. Okay, they've just defeated the whole purpose, right? Now nobody shows up for work to be the uh, police officers or anything else because the need for the money has been taken away. So that's the risk. If they only give them part of what they need to pay the tax, then you're still going to get people showing up for work. The whole point is the state needs to provision itself. It needs people working for the state, whether it's uh, s soldiers or uh, public health workers or whatever. And so UBI, at a certain point, undermines the whole thing, and the form it takes is hyperinflation. The money doesn't buy anything anymore. So it's okay in small amounts, but if you get to a, little, a tipping point, which isn't all that high, yeah, the whole thing, the whole, you threat, the whole civilization ceases to operate. So. Yeah, but if you get, yeah, if you get it, I'm just saying, if you get it wrong, is a huge penalty. It's not like there's a, yeah, it's not, it's not a small penalty. If it's a job where people have to work to get the money, that's different. In Pompeii, when they showed up to work and they were paid to sell their time, then you're going to get people looking to work. But if you don't have to do any, remember, it's only worth what you have to do to get it at the margin. And if you don't have to do anything to get it, it's, it's worth nothing. And so, I'm just, I'm not <laughs> totally against it, okay? I'm just saying you got to be very careful. You, you do have to have a sensible social security system in terms of people who've, you know, got disabilities or whatever, whatever. I mean, just one more point on that. The, the, the other thing is that if you only had a UBI and you want to discipline the inflation process, what do you have to do? You have to create unemployment. Whereas with a job guarantee, you create more employment by disciplining the inflation process. It's a very fundamental difference. Thank you. So maybe two more? How's the, yeah, one, one, two. Um, can you speak to applying MMT to developing nations, um, particularly reducing import dependence? Uh, and I'm sure Sorry, uh, can you speak to applying MMT to developing nations? Sorry, oh, okay. Um, can you speak to applying MMT to developing nations, please, uh, particularly import dependence? One of my slides was about uh, that uh, having your own currency doesn't make a nation materially rich, necessarily. It means that that nation can, or that state can always bring whatever productive resources that are available into full productive use, but the level of output might be mightn't be sufficient. And other nations uh, that I've worked in have problems with uh, food dependency and other nations have problems with energy dependency and uh, this is a good example of how we've, we're differentiating between core MMT principles and values because what I've advocated in the book that I wrote with Thomas Farsi before this one in 2017 was that a solidis solidaristic world. At the, mo at the moment, we've got multilateral institutions like the IMF and the World Bank that were created, by the way, in a different era to do different things. So the IMF was created to, to, to 
uh, provide funds to nations that were struggling to maintain the fixed exchange rate system and the World Bank was created uh, really to reconstruct Europe. And then, the, and then when we floated exchange rates in the early 70s, those institutions really lost their meaning and re, re sort of morphed into their neoliberal form. And so what I advocate as a progressive left person not as an MMTer, is eliminating those institutions and creating a new set of, a new multilateral capacity that would, it's quite clear that if a country can't export, but it needs, it has to import food and nobody will buy its exports and it can't grow its own food, then, then it's got a problem. And it's, to me, as a progressive left person, this is where I think about globalism, not the EU, but as a true global cosmopolitanism and solidarity, that we've got to create a new form of IMF that allows the advanced countries to distribute foreign currency to the poorer countries so they can eat. But that's not an, that's, that's not an MMT thing. At the beginning of Professor Bill Mitchell's uh, presentation, you mentioned robotics. And my question to the panel, not just to, to, to Professor Bill Mitchell, would be, is there a way to supplant the labor in the labor market, um, given Professor Michael Osborne at Oxford University's research that suggests that 70% of white collar jobs will disappear by 50-50, is your view that there's a way to supplant the labour? And also, I'd be interested to get your point of view on Bill, Car Bill Gates's public comments with regards to robots should be taxed as a way to actually renew the supply of taxation in the, the labour market with regards to the loss of labour in the labour market itself. I'd be interested to get your point of view on that. OK, so what, what that whole discussion does is it confuses it. <laughs> this is obviously just assuming that uh, you obviously have views with regards to the validity of the argument about robotics and, and it could be also that you you consider the whole argument just to be a total misnomer. I just, I just should have put that on the end. Okay, so what, what that argument does is, I'll say, con confuses, conflates a productivity story within unemployment story, which is an unspent income story. Unemployment's always an unspent income story. It's from somebody not spending their income and no other agent willing to spend more than his income, and so you have, get unemployment. It's a monetary phenomenon. Uh, productivity is an entirely different thing. We've already had the robot story happen, okay? It, not 200 years ago, we couldn't have this because we all had to be out growing food. You needed 99% of the people in agriculture or we weren't going to be able to eat. And today, less than 1% in the U.S. produces enough 8,000 calories a day a person or something and exports food. Uh, manufacturing now is down to 7% of the people in the U.S. If you got it up to 8%, this room would be filled with junk and we couldn't have a meeting, okay? And so we've already got productivity. It's already taken away over 90% of, 99% of the agricultural jobs, which was everybody, and then when it was manufactured, they've already lost. And unemployment is still at kind of the same numbers it's always been. All right? And that's because it's, not, it's got nothing to do with unemployment productivity. are two entirely different matters. And that's what we're trying to separate here. Uh, and, and so you want as much productivity as possible. Okay, that frees people up to do other things. There is no, <clears throat> there's always an there's always a lot more to do than there are people to do it. There are always more jobs than you could possibly do. The university professors can't possibly get all the research assistance they want. All right? <laughs> it's not possible. And so we wake up every day with a labor shortage, but we wind up with a labor surplus because we don't understand, understand the unspent income story. Uh, yes, that's, that, that's the first point. <laughs> <laughs> and the mo most, the most point, but you know this uh, this other thing, the other point I think about is that it's as if, it's as if this is sort of like a tsunami. Now tsunamis we can't really control; they just they're beyond our policy control. 
But, you know, it's sort of like saying if we stopped, uh, if we just eliminated all the traffic lights, there'd be chaos. Of course there would be. And so if this was really a, a tsunami, then we'd, be, we'd have problems. But the government can always provide conditions through which private sector activity is mediated. And so if robotics really were the problem, then we'd just say you can't do it. That's it. But the real problem is that we have created a mindset that our currency issuing governments can run out of money. And we haven't understood that unemployment is because they're not spending enough net currency into the economy. And this so that's what it's about. The robot issue is a separate issue. And sorry, Warren. And it reflects a dramatic lack of imagination on what socially productive activities that deserve to be paid can be out there. It's a massive number. I, I go running every morning. I see hundreds of jobs, well, thousands every, every day I go running. New jobs. <laughs> now, you, you might hear us be saying the government can do this, the government can do that. We've got a lot of government in this thing, which is true. But it's because the currency itself is a coercive monopoly, public monopoly. And once you've introduced a monopoly, the idea of things being settled by the free market outs, you know, it, it doesn't exist anymore. The economics professors teach, you know, versus monopoly, oligopoly, and then free market. You don't have, you know, monopoly means there aren't free markets, and that's true. And so in any market will then operate under the institutional structure set up by the government. There's no way around it once you've got this coercive taxation. And if you don't have coercive taxation, you don't have a public sector that can have a military and defend itself, that can have a legal system, that can, if you want any of these things, you've given up this whole idea of any kind of free market. You've now, it's required that, you know, everything's going to be within this monopoly that's been set up, okay? It's the antithesis of competitive markets. You can set them up to exist within it, but you can't, you know, step back and let, leave anything to the, because you've taken it away with your taxation which is a necessity for, you know, human civilization. So, uh, okay. Right, last question. Oh, I, I feel there's a great weight on my shoulders. <laughs> this has got to be a good question. But uh, My name is Stephen Wilkinson. Uh, I, I buy it. I, 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 I really appreciated what, you, what you've explained to me today because it, it does make a lot more sense to me now. Uh, I just want to ask one thing. You, you've talked about interest rates being zero. But uh, on a sort of institutional practice side, I just wanted to know what you think about what the taxation rate should be and who should pay the taxes and whether there should be a progressive income tax or whether there should be sales taxes. What kind of taxes should there be on? Who should they be levied and, and at what rate? Uh, that's, those kind of practical questions are the things that come up in my mind when you're talking. Well, I mean, certainly the, the tax system should be more progressive than it currently is. That's undoubtedly the case. Uh, sales tax is typically highly regressive. Um, so any uh, indirect taxes, I mean, depending on what the uh, taxes are imposed on, um, but that would be regressive. So, um, I mean, you can start from there and um, decide, you know, how high you can go in terms of progressivity. I mean, once upon a time, the top... UK rate was 90%, something in that order. Yeah. So I don't anticipate getting, uh, that you'll ever get back to that. But uh, there is, yeah, I mean, there's clearly a, a massive problem of inequality. We know that in, in many, many countries. And having a more progressive tax system is one way of addressing that to some degree. And the other way is to do something about, you know, executive salaries, which is another issue altogether. The, the first point is that, that modern monetary theory is about macro. And, on, and the sort of issues about tax structure 
is not the conventional realm of macroeconomics. That's the first point. It's not saying it's not important, but it's also like asking a question, well, what should uh, industry regulation be? They're separate areas of study. That's the first point. It's not, I'm not saying it's unimportant what you're saying. The second point is that there's this sort of progressive narrative that says uh, we've, we've got to tax the rich to fund public services. And uh, that's very dominant in he over here. Your shadow chancellor talks like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why I'm asking the question. That's his principal narrative. <laughs> that's why I'm asking the question. And what, what no. an understanding of modern monetary theory tells you is that's an absurd statement. Because as long as there's real resources available for sale to provision these services that you want the public sector to provide for the well-being of the population, then the government can do that. And, and, and there's sort of a philosophical view here because once you start talking, has anyone read Atlas Shrugged, Anne Rand's book? Yeah. This is a book about the importance of the, yeah. of the big man, the big, in, the big uh, industrialist, and all of us are just <laughs> parasites on their endeavour and productivity. Well, it's the same sort of argument. You're saying we've got to tax the rich to fund these basic public services for the poor. Therefore, you're saying that the rich are somehow important. And without them, we can't have equity policies at the bottom end. Well, that's just an absurd thing for a, a progressive left person to say. Now, that's not, the, so that's not to say we shouldn't be having discussions about uh, vertical equity in the tax system. In other words, making the more progressivity and having higher income people pay more tax. But it's got nothing to do with increasing the capacity of government to fund services for the lower income groups. From my point of view, we, don't, we, we, we want the top end of town, it's an Australian expression, I don't know if it's here, we want the top end of town to have less and not more because they use that to pollute the political process. They use that to fund think tanks that are on the right. They use that to lobby governments. So I don't want them to do that as much as they are doing and I'd rather them not do that. And so th they're the sort of things that I think about. But don't ever get fall into this Labor Party narrative that we've got to tax the rich to provide basic services in your health system, your education system. That's just... Ignorance. Now, I'm, I get, can get way macro on you. <laughs> so let's look in real terms. What we, don't, what we care more about is, apart from the influence, which we do care about, is consumption. What's the distribution of consumption rather than the distribution of income? So if you've got somebody in a one-bedroom apartment with 30 cats that's got $5 billion in the bank, they're not... So you don't need to take their money away for any purpose. They're, they're not doing anything except feeding a bunch of cats, right? Now, if you've got somebody else with no money that's a big wheeler dealer that's got a big yacht where they cut down half the rainforest for it and, and you know, he somehow bought it on credit, well, he's a problem. Taxing him is it's not going to happen. You know, it's wrong. So we've got to look at our consumption of, of resources. So what I look at are transactions taxes, like the income tax. What's the real cost of the, of, uh, the income tax? You know, when I talked to a friend at University of Chicago in economics, and I said I thought it was about 15% of GDP, he said you might be low. <laughs> right? These are all the costs of everybody's record keeping, okay? all the government expense collecting it, all the enforcement, all the legal expense, all the people going to school to learn about it, all the people with tax havens all over the world doing things at every level. Uh, you know, it's, it's an enormous industry that's uh, just the legal talent alone that could be out curing cancer, doing something useful, is staggering. It's absolutely staggering. So let's say it's 15% of GDP. So if you get rid of the income tax entirely, and I'll replace it with a property tax, 10% of the value of your property, just flat, all right? It's not progressive or anything, but just for this example. And there's a job guarantee, so nobody's going to lose their job and get thrown out of their house like they do in Europe. They have high unemployment, then they put a property tax on, and then all the unemployed get thrown out of their houses, you know, in the continent. So, 
or you know, Italy tried to do that. So, but not not that. So, um, so now we've increased real those fifteen percent. That fifteen percent of real GDP. Those people are now doing something else. We've got full employment policy. Where is the consumption of that fifteen percent going? It's going to go to the lower consumption groups, the lower income groups. It's not going to go to the people on top because they're not going to go from three meals a day to five meals a day because they've got more money or something like that. They're all, they're, if they're flying once a month in their private jet, they're not going to fly every two weeks because they have more money. Okay, it doesn't affect the consumption of the highest income people at all, <coughs> and probably the top 50% very little. So now the lower 50% probably aren't getting 15% of the consumption anyway. So you've pr pretty much doubled the real standard of living of the lower 50% of the population by eliminating the income tax by getting rid of all the compliance costs built in. Now, if you look at the compliance costs of all the other transaction tax, like VAT and everything else, it's staggering. Okay. We, because 1% grows the food, 7% does the manufacturing, the rest is all in services. There's a whole <coughs> lot of gains by making this thing more efficient right now. We've got a whole lot of people digging holes and then a whole lot of others filling them in at all levels. The bureaucracy has got, you know, has done that, and we can afford it because we're so productive. But those, I think, are enormous gains and an enormous way to um, raise the standard of living, you know, without, you know, and what happens is these people who want to do it by taxing the rich, and they're talking about in the states raising the marginal tax to 70 percent, they're going to turn, it's going to be an enormous amount of political capital. It'll take them four or five years. They'll get it done. Let's give them the benefit of the doubt. I'm not against it, but it's not going to change anything. So the person making $15 million, you know, takes home a million dollars a year less. I mean, so what have you accomplished? All that. And here the opportunity is there to make a serious, you know, change that doubles the standard of living of more than half of the population at no expense to anybody else whatsoever. So um, uh, our chair's gone, <laughs> so I think that's about it. <laughs>Okay, welcome back. So what did you think? You know, there's certainly a lot to digest there. If you have any questions, just leave them below in the comments. I gotta be honest with you, I'm gonna cut this short because, you know, it's late and I'm not ashamed to say it, I gotta pee. So, uh, you guys take care. I'll be back next week. Bye-bye.